Good morning, everyone. Welcome to International Reform Exodus Community. Do you know what day it is? It's Halloween. No, it's not. Uh, today is uh, Reformation Day, uh, where we celebrate again the central tenets of evangelical faith as uh, it's been described by our reformers back in the 16th century. The five solas of the Reformation, uh, scripture alone, faith alone, Christ alone, grace alone, for God's glory alone. So today, as we go into our worship, I hope that the spirit of Reformation, as we look again, dig deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ, can animate our hearts and enlarge our uh, mind as well. So we today, as we celebrate the Reformation Day, remembering all the heritage of our evangelical faith, the power of the authority of Scripture, the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ in faith alone, uh, by grace alone, for God's glory alone. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Let's begin by having quiet time. Let's pray. Amen. I invite you to stand. Church, let us confidently approach the Father's throne of grace, knowing that the way there has been opened to the perfect sacrifice of God the Son, Jesus Christ, and this gospel hope and truth has been poured out into our hearts by God the Holy Spirit. So as you come to worship today, we celebrate Reformation Day today. May the favor and the blessings of God the Father God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. You may be seated, church. The Bible says, The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness and He will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure.
give you time for the moment of confession. Let's confess all the bad deeds that we've done. All the good deeds that we failed to do. We are sinners. And we worship the Holy God. Forgive us, Lord. the blood of Christ who saved us. And why all of our sins? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your promise. That you will be with us forever until the eternity. It gives us hope. done for us you have forgive us and you have died on the cross the perfect sacrifice thank you Lord and now we are ready to worship you more and more we are ready to glorify your name 
we praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. And in your mighty name, Jesus Christ, everybody says, Amen. Church, now I invite all of us to stand up to declare our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's praise Him!
It's time now for our intercessory prayers. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you lifting, first of all, our nation, Indonesia. We pray, Father, for the economic and the political stability. We pray for the restoration of uh, society in the midst of a pandemic. We trust that you are the Lord over our nation. Oh, that you will grant wisdom and grace to our leaders in all levels so that they can come up, they can implement, they can monitor all the policies that benefit the nation, especially the most vulnerable of the people here. We pray God for economic restoration. We pray God for peace in this country. We pray for uh, the eradication of corruption, poverty, and other societal issues. And help us as your people, either corporately as the Church of Jesus Christ or personally as we are in our specific fields, help us to be the conscience of the nation and bless the nations with what we do and what you have given to us. So we pray over Indonesia for restoration, for peace, and for the flourishing of this country because you are the God that will keep us safe. Thank you, Father, we pray for this nation. Secondly, Lord, we want to lift up our congregation, especially here at REC. We pray for the spiritual health, the spiritual vitality of each and every one of us. Help us to draw near to you, Father, through our own personal spiritual disciplines, through corporate spiritual disciplines, through the gathering of the body of Christ. Help us to long to be made like you, Jesus Christ, every day. Help us not to settle into the ways of the world, but to truly be conformed by the renewing of our minds through the thought, through your spirit and your word. Help us to enjoy what you have given to us, the church, the people, the scripture, so that we can continue to grow and be used for your kingdom and glory. Thank you, Father. This is our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, it's time for us to listen for the words of God. Let's prepare our heart. Come on!
Good morning, everyone. Uh, as I've mentioned in the beginning of our worship service, uh, today we celebrate Reformation Day, uh, the birth of Protestantism, right? Uh, as you know, perhaps some of you know the story how um, the German monk Martin Luther, uh, he was responding to the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century, and he was nailing that 95 thesis right in protest of the selling of indulgence indulgences letters written by the pope supposedly forgiving people of their sins the money then used to fund church building project that act sparked the reformation as we know it today and the birth of the many Protestant church uh, from there like you have the lutheran and the anabaptist churches in germany 
You have the Anglican or Episcopalian churches in England. You have the Reformed churches in Switzerland and France and the Presbyterian churches in Scotland. Now, Reformed folk like us here at Reformed Exodus community, we have the reputation for being the smart Christians, right? It is true that our tradition has produced some of the church finest teachers, scholars, and theologians. After all, for some of you, maybe it is kind of satisfying, right, to know things, to be able to drop some knowledge to ignorant fools. <laughs> and yet, you can abuse knowledge. I remember a pastor, a friend of mine, uh, he was single and he was about to be introduced to a girl and that, but then he was rejected because apparently the reasoning was that he was not quote-unquote reformed enough. And I'm not sure if this girl is looking for a husband or a theological tutor, <laughs> but she has successfully reduced my friend's value to his knowledge and knowledge only. See, knowledge is God's gift but we can turn it into weapons of mass destruction, destroying community and relationships. Knowledge is best used to love God and others. And that's what we're going to look today. Let's open our Bible to 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1 to 3. We're going to look again at the enemy of community, the enemy of togetherness, and today we're going to specify or highlight the idea of knowledge. Knowledge, a great gift, but also a powerful destroyer of community. <clears throat> First Corinthians 8, 1 to 3. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you with this text. Help us to understand, enjoy, apply in our lives. May the gospel of Jesus Christ truly fire our hearts and our imagination. Father, help me. I am a weak and sinful preacher. Enable me to share your word, proclaim your truth in a way that is clear and helpful for everyone today. Thank you, Lord. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, let's look at a couple of things. First of all, what is this that Paul is talking about, <clears throat> about food and idols? So, Paul, in verse 1a, he introduces the food issue. Now, concerning food offered to idols. Now, food here is actually meat. Um, much in, in Corinth, much of the meat available for, you know, day-to-day -day eating or human consumption has been sacrificed to idols. You know, those uh, uh, pagan uh, uh, religion. Now, typically, part of the meat uh, was burned on the altar, part of the meat was reserved for the priest, and part of the meat was consumed by the people making the sacrifices, and the rest was available for sale. Now, the meat available for purchase, some will be served restaurant style in temples. The rest will be sold in meat markets throughout the city. Now, while it was clear that the meat served in the temples will be sacrificed to idols, it will be more difficult, or I think impossible, to determine the origin of the meat for sale in meat markets. So you have this basically two problems for Christians. One was whether it was permissible to eat meat served within the temple areas. Now, you know, newborn Christians, baby believers, they might witness that. Sophisticated Christians, other stronger Christians, eating meat at the temple, and they would, almostly, they would almost certainly conclude that those sophisticated Christians were engaged in idol worship. How can they eat meat sacrificed to idols? 
The, uh, that's, 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 that's one problem. The other problem was whether it was permissible to purchase meat that had been sacrificed to idols and to eat it at home. After all, eating meat at home is less visible, less risk. But then what happens when a non-Christian invite you to his home and serve meat? Do you, do you eat meat or, you know, you see, so you, you may wonder by this time, okay, what's, how is this relevant for me? Because we don't have, we don't, we don't eat food from, you know, sacrifice for idols, right? No, but it's actually incredibly relevant because it speaks to the issue of Christian freedom. You know, that those gray areas of Christian living, questions like this, is it right for Christians to watch TV shows or movies with cussing or nudity or crude choking? Should a believer drink alcohol or smoke? Should you allow your children or teenagers to play violent video games? Is it okay for a believer to dabble in the stock market? Is it okay to get tattoos? Is it, how about wearing a bikini? Should you use birth control or not, right? Or maybe relevant to our context here in Indonesia, especially in a Chinese uh, household, how about participating in an ancestor veneration? Or maybe, you know, yoga. And of course, with today's pandem global pandemic, the questions that kind of divided the church all over the world is, how about wearing masks? How about gathering in the church? How about getting vaccinated? And so, that's the issue right now. So Paul then moved to the people's mindset. Okay, you, we've got this different problematic, controversial, sensitive issues. Some Christians have knowledge which to say, this is okay. Some Christians will say, okay, this is bad. And that's what we're going to look at the second one, the people's mindset. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know, we know that all of us possess knowledge. All of us possess knowledge. What is that? Why is it, you know, in a, a quote, quotation form? That's a slogan, okay? That's a slogan that is used. So here's a couple of um, mindset or opinions that people have about, uh, that Christians have about those meat or food sacrificed to idols. One group believe that the spirit of the pagan gods were absorbed into the meat and that when Christians eat the meat, they will be possessed by demons if they ate it. That's one group. That's the knowledge that they have, okay? Another group think that, well, of course not. You can't be demon-possessed, but still, they don't want to eat the meat because it will be they, that, that will remind them of their lives before Christ. They might relapse, in other words. It's, it's just like, you know, how an alcoholic, when they are go to church and sometimes we have Holy Communion, we have a, some churches will provide non-alcoholic juice, just in case you have a former alcoholic Christian coming in and you don't want to drink that. You see, that, 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 that's the kind of thing. So better not eat meat at all. I know meat is okay, but, you know, I might, it might tempt me, tempt me to fall to sin again. Now, the third group understood that an idol was just a block of wood or stone. It had no power whatsoever, therefore could not contaminate, con contaminate the meat, and it's okay to eat the meat. Now, all of, from all of these three mindsets, Paul definitely belonged to the third group, okay? And when he says, all of us possess knowledge, he's saying, it's okay to eat meat. The stronger Christians, that's, that's the, the stronger Christians, that's the, another term that Paul used in Romans. The stronger Christians with the stronger conscience, they would say it's, eating meat is okay, it's not a big deal. So Paul could have pressed the point and told those who had problem with eating the meat, guys, just get over yourselves. We're Christians. We are free. You can eat whatever you want. He might have even argued that though they, they should eat the meat as a sign to the world that the pagan gods have no power over the believers. You see, 
you might think that you know uh, the stronger Christian they can use their knowledge but it's equal it's it's actually equally tempting for both sides to condemn the other you see the person with more knowledge is tempted to condemn the person with less knowledge or less uh, freedom of conscience they, they will think man he doesn't understand his freedom in Christ He's self-righteous, he's immature, it's all about the rules, come on, we can eat anything we want, we can watch anything we want, we can go anywhere we want. There's no rules because we are free in Christ. So the person with more freedom, more knowledge, condemn the person that has less. But the opposite is true, the person with less liberty or less freedom is tempted to condemn the person, the Christian with more liberty. And they think, He's a liberal Christian, a carnal, compromising Christian. He doesn't know what holiness is. How can he just drink alcohol wherever he goes? So the question for us here is that this, does knowledge, how does knowledge affect you with your relationship with other Christians? Does knowledge cause you to condemn and look down on others? Because it's easy to, you know, um, Pick your sides and attack one another over this. And so Paul finally helps us with this idea of having more knowledge by uh, basically telling us, giving us a broad principles, how to best use knowledge. First one, C and the rest. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something he does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. The best use of knowledge. Now see, Paul is not against smart people. He is against a knowledge, and by the way, the Greek is gnosis. So this word means um, human autonomy at the expense of concern for others. Knowledge that kind of stresses freedom. I, I, I can do this. I know this to be right. I don't care what you think. I'm just going to do it my way. That kind of knowledge. Okay? So, <clears throat> knowledge, again, is a great gift from God. But these Corinthian Christians, well, they're smarter than most. But they have become prideful concerning their knowledge. And by the way, this is the fifth time Paul has used this word, um, puffs up. In his letter, it is sometimes translated arrogant or inflated with pride. In one um, comic strip, Peanuts, uh, uh, the ill-tempered Lucy walks into the room where her little brother Linus is watching TV. Linus says, I was here first, so I get to watch what I want. Now, without Acknowledging him, Lucy just walks over to the TV and switches over to another channel. Hey! shouts Linus. Finally, Lucy, the older sister, looks at him and then comments. In the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, it says, Many that are first will be last, and the last first. <laughs> so Linus loses out. And in the final caption, he murmurs to herself, I bet Matthew did not have an older sister. From this comical, uh, you know, uh, uh, cartoon, you, you can see how Lucy, her mind is sharp, right? But her heart is cold, and her theology is a weaponized lock and load, ready to shoot theology. But then... This is something that, you know, uh, remind us of how, um, you know, how we use things that we know more. I mean, sorry, think about an, an issue or topic that you know a lot about. The topic that you know a lot about. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's politics, maybe it's money management, or maybe it's about Spider-Man. I don't know. Do you look down on people who aren't as well informed as you? Has your knowledge puffed you up? And try to apply this spiritually. You know, flirtatious behavior might be innocent. But you could lose all the innocence in the presence of a weak Christian. They might misunderstand it. Careless attitudes or words towards money might tempt a weaker Christian to do something dishonest. Right? And 
sometimes when we have knowledge, you know, um, when we have, when we know more, sometimes it's about just protecting our ego, and we just want to debate people. You know, let, let, let's face it. Sometimes we argue just because we don't want to be wrong. I mean, we are so sure of our position, but it's not about the issue anymore. It's just I want to win. You know, you feel strongly about winning, not strongly about the issue. You see. Now, of course, when you do this, it rarely accomplish anything productive. Instead, if you win the battle, because you, you have the, you are more knowledgeable, you've likely damaged the relationship. Remember, church, that arrogance is hard to hide. Arrogance is hard to hide. And then some of us, you know, when we have this knowledge, sometimes we, you know, sometimes we just fight in about issues that are secondary non-essential issues like about what happens at the end of time what's that 1000 uh a year uh, uh, 1000 kingdom you know uh at the book of matthew 1000 year uh what's that all about and then we debate about creation about baptism about lord's supper no i'm not saying that you should never get your way but i think you should need to weigh the upside of winning versus valuing your brother and sister in Christ and his opinions. If you have to win every battle, I think you'll end up battling more and more. So let's pay attention to how we use what we know to other people. Are we just protecting our ego? Are we fighting the smaller matters and make it more important than it actually is have we looked down on people and so paul then continues while knowledge buffs up love builds up builds up here means it edifies it blesses it lifts up both people it lifts up the people that loves and lifts up the people who is love see here and this is what's a radical about uh, about Paul, about the gospel, Paul never conceives us, Christian believer, as independent individual. Like, I can make a decision based on what I know. I don't care how it affects other people. No. Paul is saying, no. Christ believers, we are first and foremost involved in a community. We are interconnected to one another. My decision matters. And what should guide my actions is not about what I know. It's about love for, you, for the community. The thing to consider is not just right or wrong, but is it loving or unloving? And when you have sensitive, controversial, or gray area issues, we should never ask, how far can I go? With, you know, uh, I guess, how far can I go with having a tattoo or, or uh, whatever. The question is, what are my motives in the first place? I mean, look at Paul and how, how he is always thinking about love. For instance, in verse 13, he says, If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul loves his brothers and sisters in Christ so much that if he knew that they're seeing him eat meat would cause them to stumble, then he simply will stop eating meat. He'll go vegan, basically. Eating meat is not that big of a deal. He loves his brother more than his freedom to eat meat. In verse 11, Paul says, And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, meaning not weak as in but weak in conscience, yeah, different conscience. The brother for whom Christ died. So you can see how you can hurt your brother in Christ by your knowledge. And if that's not enough, he says finally in verse 12, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Such unloving use of knowledge against a fellow Christian amounts to sin against Jesus himself. 
Now you might be wondering why it's you that has to change and not them. Why is it all on me? Why can't they get over themselves and realize that this is okay and deal with it? Now, first, because it's always a stronger person who has to help the weaker person in life, right? Whether it's stronger mentally, emotionally, or physically, if you want a relationship with someone who is weaker, you have to help them. You are the ones who have to make the adjustment for them. After all, this is what we do for our kids. We don't look down on them because they don't know or because they're not as physically strong. No, we help them because we love them. And secondly, why it's us that has to change, not them, we do this because our model is Jesus. Think about it. We cannot even begin to imagine the freedom and the privileges that belong to the Son of God in heaven. To be God is to be completely free. And yet Christ, he did not live pleasing himself. He gave up his rights and freedoms to become a servant. A servant of sinners. I think Keller said it best. Christianity is the only religion that claims God gave up his freedom so we could experience the ultimate freedom from evil and death itself. He sacrificed his independence for you so you can sacrifice yours for him. And when you do, you will find that it is all the ultimate, infinitely, liberating constraint. constraint the ultimate infinitely liberating constraint we do this because we look up to Christ after all if we, if we continue again in verse 2 if anyone imagines that he knows something he does not yet know as he ought to know see the word things or imagines is interesting you can mean it can mean think or seem or suppose. So Paul is saying a person who pres presumes to have knowledge is not likely to have it. If, he know, if, he, if you know so much, if you know everything, why bother learning, right? So ironically, knowing a little bit of knowledge becomes a barrier to true knowledge. And if you ask the truly smart or learned people, they'll tell you, that there is still so much to learn. Now, sometimes, I think one of the um, way I can look at this is that, you know, I know that there's a church where a single man uh, angrily objects to having church fellowship meals. Why? The reason is not, it's not clear, it's not biblical. But because of that one man, for 20 years, the congregation had not had a meal together in their church building. One man's irrational opinion has dictated the activities of everyone. His one knowledge, you know, kind of destroy the whole fellowship. So I think the application is this. Those of you with a weak conscience in a particular area, you have the responsibility not to police others by pressuring them to adopt your strict standards. You should keep these matters between yourself and God. Don't impose your conscience on everyone else in the church, especially if it's issue that God does not clearly command. And with regards to eating, it's quite clear if you read Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible has to be our standard of truth. The Bible is over everyone, even our individual conscience. Now, if you have a personal opinion, it's okay. But don't use, don't, don't use that as a rule to judge everyone else, especially if that issue is something that is not biblically mandated. Now, this principle doesn't also mean that, that the strong then, you know, have to agree with the position of the weak. 
It doesn't even mean that the strong can never again exercise their freedoms. It's like, oh, he's, he's the, the one that has issue with alcohol is coming, so let's hide the booze. It's not like that. I think strong Christians, they can agree to free to exercise their liberty in any context, but let's not flaunt, let's not post it in the ways that might portray the weaker brother as foolish, immature, or naive. And we have to be especially careful to nurture the faith of young people and new Christians, because they might misunderstand. They might judge us otherwise. We have to be careful around them, to love them, to not sear their conscience. In the end, church, the main thing worth knowing is how to love God and build people up through love. The main thing worth knowing about is how to love God and build people up through love. Theology is about loving God and one another more perfectly. Let's use knowledge not to simply educate or to debate because you like it so much. Knowledge is best used to love people, to serve people, and to equip people to adore God. And that's what Paul finally confirms in verse 3. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. Paul shifts the emphasis from knowing to loving. The key to the Christian life is not knowing all the answers. The key to Christian life is loving God. Paul promises that the person who loves God will be known by God. So, it's more important in a way to be known by God than to possess knowledge, right? Now, it will be one thing for me to tell you I know about Jokowi. But it's quite another when the president of Indonesia, Jokowi himself, let's say, mentions my name and thanks me at his next national press conference. It's not merely that I know him, he knows me. It will make all the difference in the world. And here's the same. Paul says we are known by God. He says, in essence, you know God? Actually, here's a better way to say it. You are known by God. God knows me. And this is so personally life-changing. It made me realize that all this other stuff, like being smart, being a good theologian, being a good speaker, is not the goal. I mean, when people say, wow, you are so smart, you know all about the Bible, you can explain it well, that's great. But at the end of the day, I would want people to know me as someone who loves God, who lives like Jesus Christ, right? Wasn't becoming more like Jesus supposed to be the goal of gaining all this knowledge? about him in the first place. You know, I remember one, one pastor, he said, you know, in the end, I don't want to be the best speaker in the world or the best writer or the most intelligent person on the planet. It simply doesn't matter. And he's right. What matters is not having all the knowledge in the world, even, even knowledge about God. What matters is about loving Jesus and becoming more like him. That's what changes people. And so, church, let me close with this. Martin Luther, he was finally condemned, excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church, right? And uh, he was threatened to be charged as a heretic, and the church ordered him to halt his preaching. And so the Pope at the time, he... Uh, had issued this statement and he was condemning 41 errors for which Luther deserved excommunication. Now he thought it would silence the pesky monk, but the Pope misjudged badly. From that, you know, um, letter from the, from, from the Pope to, to excommunicate Luther, Luther in fact replied by writing one of his famous work on the freedom of the Christian, freedom of the Christian. Uh, in it, he is talking about Christian freedom, how we should 
you know, uh, move with these ideas of knowledge and love. And Luther begins his writing with this seemingly paradoxical statement, which I want to close our sermon with. This is what he says. A Christian is an utterly free man, Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian, at the same time, is an utterly dutiful man, servant of all, subject to all. Luther is saying, by faith alone, we are free. We are righteous Christian in Christ Jesus. By faith alone, our inner man, inside, we are free. But as we go out into the world, our freedom doesn't mean that I can do however I want, freedom for freedom's sake. No, I am freed by God from death, from sin, from competition, from uh, having to prove yourself. I'm free from all of that. In order, I can love. I can be of service to my neighbors, subject even to everyone. This is the paradox church of the Christian freedom, faith and love. Let's use our knowledge in the service of God and to love others. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your, uh, for your word today. And now we want to give some time to reflect on this passage again. Father, if we have misused, abused our privilege, knowledge to serve ourselves, to promote ourselves instead of to love and serve others, forgive us. Lord, help us to investigate our hearts. If we have been accumulating knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, not for the sake of loving you and loving others. Forgive us. And teach us now to use what we know to adore you and to give up some of our rights so that we can love others, so that we can adjust our lives, our freedom to accommodate those who are weaker than us. Not, it's, not, it's not a position that we it's not a patronizing position. It's just simply that we want to adjust so that we can love others well and better. I ask Lord to apply what we know today and what we have today in our daily life. Thank you, Father, for your word and help us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, we also want to pray right now for the offering. Bless this time. Help us to give and help us to give cheerfully. Bless this offering for your kingdom and for our joy as well. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let's use what we know to love God and to love others, to be like Jesus Christ in what we do as we grab the spirit of Reformation Day to truly proclaim the gospel of grace in our lives and also for the world. We are free, but we are also servant for Christ. So now, church, before you go, I invite you to stand and receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.